Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. My name is Bree Noble. I am so happy to be here today with Eric Andreas from Your Guitar Sage. And I love these conversations because I am not a guitarist, so I can learn a lot from Eric and kind of the the world of guitarists. But we're also going to talk about musicians and business and career and all of that great stuff and online um, Eric has made such an amazing career online. Um, I mean, it says that he's had 150 million views on YouTube and over 700,000 people in his courses. That is insane. I, I can't even imagine. Of course, he started in 2006. So that is a long time to be building up those numbers. But we'll get into all that. But let's start with, you know, kind of your orange, origin story, Eric. Like, how did you get started? Are you just, you know, someone who loved to play the guitar and um, just started making videos doing it? How did how did that all turn into what it is now? Yeah, man, it, honestly, Bree, as far back as I can remember, I've just always been obsessed with music uh, as a little kid. So I've got uh, an eight-year-old boy now, and I could think back to his age and earlier where my family would be playing classical music and Elvis and, and operas and classic some classic rock and and what have you. And I just remember just sometimes just sitting by the speakers, trying to get inside of what it was that I was hearing, like trying to understand it more, uh, conceptualize it, you know, from a really young age and just being moved by music so much. Um, And it wasn't, uh, let's see, it wasn't until I was about 14 years old that I started getting serious about playing guitar uh, I had an opportunity before where I where I had a guitar and I just it just didn't happen at that moment um, earlier, maybe when I was about 10. And then at 14, I had another opportunity. It was to to get karate lessons or to get guitar lessons. And I <laughs> said, man, I, I just I love this guitar and really started getting into it. Uh, that was at 14. And by 16, I was just so obsessed with the instrument that I was. Uh, teaching my buddies at, at at high school, you know, in high school, they we had my little set of buddies that played guitar. And uh, shortly after, I was just so obsessed with it that I was teaching them and then went to music college a few years later, moved to Nashville just a few years after that, uh, became a music business major. And I've always had that entrepreneurial spirit. My family, like everybody is is, a, is an entrepreneur. Everybody owns their own business. Um, and lots of friends and families, uh, family members who also own their own businesses. So uh, for me, it m- made sense when I was in that transition from being in college and going into the uh, professional world, uh, wearing the tie and doing the things that you're just like, why am I doing this? Um, all the while I was teaching. And eventually I just said, this is, I'm not having fun doing this other corporate thing. Like I'm good at it, you know, sales and did banking, did real estate, did, did a bunch of stuff. And, but, but was never truly like, you know, doing that for eight hours a day was satisfying. Like there was a bit of it that was satisfying. I try to find joy in everything that I do. And 2006, when YouTube became a thing, I would have all my one-on-one students, which I had many at that time, dozens, and uh, worked my worked my way up into to about seventy lessons a week. I was trying to calculate Ooh. it last night, actually, and it was that was mad. I was like fourteen a day. Oh. Uh, yeah, it was, it was madness, and I loved it. It was great. It was good money, and I loved working with folks and seeing them the next week and them improving and everything. Just loved that. And then what I did without really thinking about any sort of like growth, I was like, man, I'm, I'm teaching this Taylor Swift tune for the ninth time this week because it's on, obviously on the radio, you know? And uh, and I would just say, well, I'm going to make a video for this, like right after it, I'll upload it to YouTube. And my students can watch it and I can help them 
Um, didn't think anything of it, you know. And um, and then in short time, I really started getting like a lot of views, and it got to got to a point where I was getting 50, 60,000 views a day on these hand, um, you know, these few videos that I put up. And then of course, then my entrepreneurial gears started, uh, started clicking. And I said, well, let me just go ahead and start doing this then let this be a thing. But it wasn't probably, uh, I'd say a year or two into it before I started thinking about monetizing, right? Thinking about, well, how can I make this thing bigger? I know some people like they look down at that that thought of monetizing anything, which is comical because I always say, "Well, let let me know where you work, and I'll because I'm gonna come get some free stuff." Every you know, everybody, every, but whenever exactly. it comes to art or art or anything, I don't know for some reason people have this thought like it should just be free, and it's like, well, there's <laughs> cost to make things, right? Yeah. So so yeah, so what I did is I took every, every bit of knowledge that I that I had that I could pack into a little ebook, and I started selling this ebook. I just put a little you know, URL at the bottom of my videos and started to get sales. And it was crazy. So I, I knew once I had the first one, uh, I knew that I could sell a million of them. And um, I remember specifically like setting, I'm kind of a tech geek a little bit. And I remember specifically setting up a, a register cha-ching kind of sound on my phone, or I, maybe it was on my computer. But whenever that, that a specific you know, when it came in, the, that's the sound my computer would make. So it was on all day and I'd get the regular email and then I'd hear cha-ching. And then that started happening more and more where I had to turn that off. And I was like, okay, this is a good problem to have. Getting annoying, yes. Yeah. And so like for years, that's all I did is I uploaded songs to YouTube and I had this ebook, this little $10 ebook that I sold. And that was enough to like pay for lots of things and pay for my family and, and bills and everything else. And then in 2012... Uh, I really decided to ramp it up and to create a full curriculum. So mm -hmm. uh, over a thousand lessons now, um, well, well over a thousand lessons. And then that's not in including like another 1800 lessons on YouTube and other courses in different places and partnerships and what have you. And so, so it's just kind of grown into this thing now where I have all these courses and I have them you know, employees and I, it's, it's just wild what it's become. And so, yeah, that's, that's kind of how it got, it got started. And since I really had no intention on it doing this, you know, in the beginning where it's going to go, I don't really have an idea. I mean, I, I obviously would like it to grow and would like to reach more people and doing all those things to do so, you know? Wow. I mean, your story reminds me so much of Pat Flynn. Are you familiar with Pat Flynn? smart passive income same kind of thing yeah, where he, yeah he just like he was kind of a, like he wasn't thinking about selling at first and then he was like kind of afraid to sell so he just put up this little thing that wasn't that much money and then he sold one and he was like oh wow this is an actual thing and then he i think he set up that sound too that's what reminded me of it and like that's hilarious it's yeah. like so it's so motivating uh-huh yeah yeah you got to do something to motivate you for for the longest time i wouldn't i didn't have any notifications like that now recently as of, I don't know, maybe like eight months ago or, or so, I decided to to get notifications again on my phone every time I got a sale. And I'm glad that I have. It was number one, it's motivating, but then also it helps me to understand kind of what's happening with my business. So I know when mm -hmm. there's a lull, um, I know when we're doing a promotion, because honestly, so many things are so systematized now with my with my team that um, a lot of times I'll forget when when it is that we're doing a promotion because we have such a pipeline. So I'll, mm -hmm. you know, create the emails and I'll create the, well, I'll create the course, I'll create the emails and the, the videos and everything, the sales videos that go along with that. And then, you uh, and then they just ask me for the assets for the pieces. And then it goes into the pipeline and then I'll, you know, be like, oh man, that particular course is doing really good. Oh yeah. We're doing a promo this. Right. This I know. It's like when you first start out, you're doing it all yourself and you're so like yeah. immersed in it and you're like, I'm, I'm writing an email, I'm sending it immediately. And, you know, and then you see the result yes. and then you get to the point where you're like writing your emails three weeks before the promo. And like you said, yeah. you don't even realize that it's happening because you're onto something else. Exactly. Yeah. And that's a kind of a weird feeling. Yeah. I remember like editing I mean, just doing everything, editing that I built my own website. I, you know, there wasn't anything that I didn't do, you know, pub yep. publishing books and uh, creating the PDFs and they were so janky and, and like just pieced together. And like, and even before that, man, I remember creating a, like an HTML web page that I did in, like, I don't know what it was. It might've been just raw HTML 
and uh, and it was like a basically like a chord catalog for for guitar chords. Mm. And I sold it for I think ten bucks. And I made these little CDs, and I was burning CDs at home and selling them on eBay. And I sold a ton of those. You know, uh, I might have made like a hundred bucks a day on, on on that sort of thing, like back in the day. You know, and right. so you get a, a taste of like, well, gosh, I could this could be something, especially if I started getting professional about it. You know which we were talking about before the call, you know, a lot of, a lot of, as an artist, yeah, you, you, there's this kind of wrestling that goes on in your mind. I think of like, well, there's the art. I got into this because of art, because it's something that I love. And then now we're monetizing it. And it's that balancing act of like keeping the love for the music. And at the same time, it's like, you know, my daughter's going through it right now. She's living in New York city. She's an artist. My wife's a professional songwriter uh, in Nashville and, you know, we tried to get her on the train of like, okay, working for these record companies and you could do this on the side. And she's like, no, I don't want to have anything to do with that. That's just like completely, um, I forgot what the word she used, but basically, you know, she's like, that's just not being sincere. And I like want sell to sell out just, or something. I like yeah. to sell out. That's what it was. She thought that was being a sellout. And I'm like, well, it's not being a seller because you're you're just working for those people, but you have the connections and everything. Well, now she's working in New York as a, as a barista. She's doing her music, which she's phenomenally. Um, she's a phenomenal writer, phenomenal uh, musician. She's doing great things, but you know, for eight hours out of the day, she's kind of frustrated because she's doing nothing towards her music. And so um, there's that constant balancing act of like, well, I got to make money, right? Unless you have like someone who's just going to pay for everything. You have to be an artist because you because this is why you got into it. But as we grow up and we got bills, then we got to like face that thing as well. So it's been a balancing act. And I still try to do that because in a business like like I have online, there's an infinite amount of things you could do, an infinite amount of work you could do, an infinite amount of promotion and emails and uh, just everything. And so what yes, I try to do more channels you could be on. Yeah, totally. Everything more partnerships, more just all. And so I, what I try to do is I just try to make it as natural as possible. And I really, you know, it's easy for me to say now on this side of it, for someone starting off, you kind of don't know what those things are. So you have to try everything, but in short time, if you're really hustling, then you start realizing, okay, well, this thing's really paying off. I'm spending a lot of time with this thing and it's not working. So like, let's free up some time. So I love, I'm obsessed with um, efficiency. And that's another thing of mine, which is probably why I teach guitar well, is because I like to get people from here to there as quickly and as effectively as possible. And that requires some thinking and some hacking and some taking stuff out that, you know, people fear, well, if you take that out, you're going to you're not get the full picture. And it's like, that doesn't work like that. You can put it, but just put it at the end. Pareto's mm -hmm. rule, right? 20% yeah. of the right stuff yields 80% of, of, of what it is you're looking for. So, um, so yeah, it's right now it's just uh, same thing. The business has changed so much. I say the business, what I, what it is that I do has changed so much over the years, but at the same time, the thing that hasn't changed is that everything just constantly changes and yeah. you just have to keep up with it and, and work with the, the variables, you know? Yeah. I love Pareto's rule. And there's an, uh, an exercise that I have my students do at the end of the year, um, where they look through all the things it's really a lot of it is about their marketing channels and like their income sources and looking at all the things that they do and saying like, okay, how much time do I spend on this? What am I yielding out of it? How much do I like it? How much do I feel confident in doing it? And you know, that I could grow it and just really kind of giving that like number values and then yeah looking, looking at that going, okay, is there any point in continuing with this thing? Like this thing is frustrating me and it's only yielding this much. Whereas yes. this other thing, you know, I feel really confident in and it's yielding a lot better results. And sometimes we just don't look at that because we're just go, 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 go. And I need to be here and I need to be there and I need to be, you know, and everybody says I need to be everywhere and all that. Mm -hmm. And we don't, right? Like, I think you oh, are a good, you know, you showed us that like you focused on YouTube and you lucked out. You were very early in YouTube, which yes. does help. Yep. But it, it, I like, just like I was very early to podcasting. So I can say, oh, I have these shows. They were on new and noteworthy. They were number one in this category. You know, I could never be number one now because yeah. I'm too late to the game. So sometimes yeah. you get lucky, but yeah. sometimes it's about what you're good at. Like I kept podcasting because I was good at it and it was yielding good results. Yes. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah, seems like a very logical thing to do, but it's not. I mean, teaching guitar is the same way. There's so much that just seems very logical, but what I've learned is like you just have to throw that away because it's not and and people don't think that way and that's your job. It's mm-hmm. to guide them and to not be like, come on, this is obvious. They, they don't need that. You know what I mean? They need someone to say, check to see if the stuff that you're doing is yielding results. And you go, ah, oh, that's a good idea. And then you do it and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm doing all these things that aren't yielding results. Let's get rid of that stuff. Like, I think people are afraid of the void. Uh, you know, well, what am I going to do? And, the, and it's like, oh, trust me, you leave that void there. The universe is going to bring something that's going to replace that time with something that's bigger and better. Yep. Yep. Every- definitely. And we were talking before we started about artists and the entrepreneurial spirit and that kind of thing. Do you think that if an artist doesn't naturally have the entrepreneurial spirit like you did or have all those examples in your life, which you were very lucky that you did, do you think that they can still make it as a musician, you know, what do they need to to learn or get, you know, what experience they need to get to be able to kind of build up that entrepreneurial side? Because we do kind of have to run our own business, especially in the start. Yeah, I've thought about this one a lot. And I feel like, you know, if, if you have zero marketing skills and zero entrepreneurial skills and what have you, then whatever it is that you do, you better be the best because no one has, especially in 2024, No one's going to give you a second thought. So all the, I think I'm the best, all of the stuff our mom says to us, which not discounting that, but like in our friends and family, it's like, they're going to be nicer. You know, you start having a following and, and people are just always showing up to your shows or whatever. And they're just obsessed with you. It's like, it's such a, it's such a rare thing. It's, it's not rare that it could happen. It can happen to anybody, but not without lots of hard work and dedication. And it's like, if if you're not going to be that person who does any sort of marketing, then you better be so insanely good at whatever it is that you do that someone's going to see you and go, dear Lord, what is that person playing in this venue? And how can we capitalize on it? And no, and at the end of the day, someone's going to want to capitalize on you. You know what I mean? Someone's going to want to make money. And if you don't want that, then that's that's okay too. You can not pay bills and and be you know true hundred percent artist. And that exists out there. And it's and there's a really cool thing about that when you see these street musicians that are you know they're just the best of the best and they're not going to go anywhere other than playing that street. And they're probably making some decent money at that point anyhow. But I think you have to, you know, you see the opposite too. You take somebody like, I don't know, Taylor Swift, you know, Taylor Swift, when she started off was not a very good singer. I think, honestly, I think, I think most people who who know a good voice would say that she doesn't really have a good voice, but she was a a really good songwriter. And now she's become this just insane songwriter. I mean, like um, our family's humming her songs all the time. Um, She's so good. And she, and she learned and she, you know, she got but she's also amazing at marketing and everything else, right? Um, so that's a perfect example of somebody who, uh, you know, did the most with what she had. Yep. And um, she clearly loves it. And she's so yes. dang prolific. I'm like, how can she be coming out with another so freaking album? Yeah, it's insane. Like, like, it's <laughs> just absolutely insane. I, I, I mean, the Beatles haven't even, you know, and I, that's my favorite. And they band. had more than one per. Yeah, I mean, they had all these writers. You know, it's like yeah. crazy. But she just keeps cranking them out. It's just pretty remarkable, and 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 um, and just her live shows and everything. Just so much energy, so much like, you know, in in her case, I think there's there's so much other there's so many other things that go along with that right so like my wife um wrote with taylor like before she hit it big and you know back back in the day you know you have to make choices with who it is that you're writing with and are you going to write with that person again and so she Mm -hmm. wrote with taylor and there was at some point you know some somebody in the mix probably made some sort of decision like okay well that right isn't going to happen again (laughs) you know what i mean and it's like you don't always know you just don't always know so it's Mm -hmm. like you learn as you go along. Yeah, definitely. So but, let's I, but, talk a little... oh, but going back to that, oh, I, I'd yeah. say, yeah, you, you, you gotta, you know, I didn't even finish that point. Sorry. What I was saying, the, the, the point that I was trying to make there with that latter part was that you can take mediocrity, not that Taylor's mediocre, but her voice at the time was, mm-hmm. um, she's an insane superstar now, but you can take mediocrity and market it really well and do better than a person of much, 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 much more talent who's not marketing themselves at all. 
So uh, to me, there's got to be some sort of thing where you where what it is that you do is heard in mass amounts, you know, or seen in front of a huge crowd because you can only one or two people. I mean, how long does that take to convert the world to being a believer of a massive fan by doing one or two people a day or whatever? You know yeah. what I mean? So you gotta, there's got to be some way that you can get in front of a lot of people. OK, done. Yeah, no, 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 that's good. I, I agree. I, I absolutely agree because it, no one's going to, even if you're the, like, I think about the street musicians, they are incredible, yeah. right? And if the right person comes along and sees them and, and wants to take them on as a project and, you know, then that yeah. might happen for them, but they might not be in the right place to build an audience and, and really take off as an artist. Probably not because yeah. they, they probably have some degree of knowing how good they are because they, they're doing it for eight, 10 hours a day and they're getting the crowds and, and there's a certain thing. There's a certain like Quan that, you know, as a musician or an artist where, you know, when, you know, you see it and you can name any of the, the bands or, or artists when they just were hitting big and you could see it in their eyes. They're like obsessed, you know, mm -hmm. they're, they're possessed by greatness and they know it. They, they, they have that swagger and what have you. So it's like those musicians, the street musicians, they know they're great, but there's a reason they're usually playing on the streets because they're pretty happy with where they're at. They don't want to compromise or they're, they're fearful of growth or, or, any combination of things in there. And there's nothing wrong with that. If that's, that's a beautiful, that could be a beautiful life of just not getting involved in the machine of yep. things. Yeah. Um, maybe they don't want to be a personality. You know what I mean? They want to be known as a musician. They don't totally want to have to be a brand. I knew one of these guys actually, uh, became a buddy of mine. His name is Ben Pegg and he's this amazing guitar player, um, in, in Key West. And that's where I saw him first time he played other places, but he's exactly that. And, uh, you know, it's a beautiful life to just be that too. You know, there's so many different ways to be happy. For sure. Well, okay. So since you're a guitar teacher, let's talk a little bit about guitar. I don't play guitar, <laughs> but okay. I, I have messed, I have one in the back here, but I've, I've messed around a little bit. I can, I understand how a guitar works. I can understand how to figure out what chords are because I understand music theory, that kind of thing. Right. Um, and I love the guitar but yeah. I am, I'm more of a pianist, but tons of the people that I work with are guitarists because a lot of them are singer songwriters. And it's just kind of an, an easy, an easy instrument to start on, I think. And so is there, are there any particular things that you do as a guitar teacher that make you different from, there's plenty of other guitar teachers online as well. What do you think that draws so many people to your videos? I think because I'm such a hacker, because I like to disassemble things, I, I'm really one of those people that is dissatisfied with with just, okay, this is how we do it. It's like, I always like to know why is it that we're doing it that way? Because if I know why, if I understand the theory as to why we're doing a particular thing, then it will forever be with me. And then not only that, understanding how it works will get my gears thinking in different different directions that I could improve on whatever it is that we're doing, uh, as opposed to just being told, well, this is why we do it. So mm -hmm. I think because of that natural spirit within me, and then also, I really love just seeing improvement in the world, in people, in beings. I just love all the positive emotions of joy and happiness and gratitude and everything else. And so I love to be able to have someone have a question and then I, and then maybe with some doubt or whatever. And I say, look, here's the path. It's happened a hundred percent of the time for every one of my students who listen to what I'm, what it is that I'm about to tell you do this and you'll get there. And so to be able to break things down in a, in a palatable way that allows a student to feel that progress, to feel good about what it is that they're doing, to cut out all the stuff that isn't good, you know, that isn't, that isn't stuff they need to be learning now. They're, they could learn it possibly. We'll put it at the end. But right now, these are the things that you got to do that's so important. So curating and putting things in an order that's kind of impenetrable, if you will, if you will, unstoppable, which is the name mm. of my guitar system, the unstoppable guitar system. So there's a reason for that is I wanted this to be something that, you know, people have this germination of like, oh, I want to play guitar. I want to be a musician. That's something that's very real. And if it's not cultured, just like a seed, which I've just recently gotten into gardening big time, it's <laughs> like, if it's not cultured correctly, then it's just not going to do anything. This seed has the potential to be a huge plant or a tree, you know, 
that can produce an insane amount of food. But if that germ is not treated correctly, and especially in the beginning, then it's not going to go anywhere. It's just going to, it's going to wither. So, and as, uh, you know, someone who's learning the guitar, they don't know that. That's like at, telling the seed, what do you, let's say asking a seed what it needs. What do you need to flourish? It's like, you know, no response. So like a new guitar player is not going to know that. A new guitar player is looking for guidance. He's looking for, for that moving forward. And having taken lots of guitar lessons growing up and working with, you know, so many dogmatic mindsets and what have you, I realized that there's plenty of teachers out there. And there's not plenty of great teachers out there, mm. right? There's plenty of teachers, but not plenty that, that are just obsessed with their students progress which i've always been obsessed with my students progress uh if they're showing that they're you know meaningful and that they're they're wanting to to actually do this and do the work and everything i, I wouldn't have time for folks that you know that think it's just gonna that they're born with it or something which is <laughs> plenty of that i had plenty of plenty of uh, plenty of parents that would bring their star kids into me and what have you and I just didn't like working with them because they thought everything was going to be easy. And, you know, maybe they've been singing since they were three and they're good at it, but they don't realize that they've actually been practicing for, you know, 10 years here. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, so for me, like being able to break things down and, and pull people through the process and be encouraging as encouraging as I am, that that's kind of the magic sauce, if you will, and what I teach, because obviously whether it's guitar or tennis or vocal, you know, vocal lessons or piano or anything. It's not like there's anything new. It's not like people are coming up with new stuff <laughs> to learn, right? It's all the same stuff for thousands of years or whatever, since whatever, the, however long the instrument's been around. So the way that you do it, right? So yeah. that's, I would say that's the differentiating factor there is the way that I teach is very different from, you know, a lot of other folks out there. And, and what are some of those, those barriers that keep people from like what I said, oh, I can play some chords and, you know, to actually like saying I am a guitar player. Like what, what are those? I know for me, some of the barriers were like not being able to change chords quick enough or, yeah. you know, or not being able to play an F very well. So I can't play in C and, you know, being limited by the keys you can play in and stuff. What, what are some of those things that people struggle with that you help them get over that hump? Yeah. Well, there are specific things like exactly what you're talking about there, like um, understanding how to strum and what that means to be in time with your strum. Like that, that's one of the big ones. Mm -hmm. uh, transitioning from one chord to the next, the F chord, uh, you know, bar chords in general. I just did a huge blog on that today. You know, like all of those are the, the things, but if we back up even a, a step further, which this again would be the difference between the way I teach and the way a lot of other guitar teachers teach is those that have been around students a long enough time know that those are three things that are definitively on the forefront of a beginner's guitar player, you know, hit list of what they, what they're frustrated with. But if we go beyond that and we say, well, you know, the reason that guitar is in your corner all the time, they're not being picked up is because it's not exciting enough. It's not moving forward enough. But if every time you picked that thing up, it brought you joy and it brought you excitement, then you're just going to grab it. Just like, it's just something we do. It's like mm. eating, like eating a particular thing that we like. And so uh, if that process, one, can be broken down into steps that are not only doable, but but you can actually see the progress. You know, uh, what, what happens is a lot of times people take these broad strokes and they say, well, I can't play the F chord. I've heard that 10 million times um, and because it's a real thing. It's literally like the one chord that, that, that you got to fit into stuff. If you're playing the open position that you're like, dang it, man, that chord keeps coming up or a B minor chord, which is uh -huh. that's the other one effectively the same shape. And so you run into those two chords sometimes when you're in your side, like, I got to skip this song. But so, you know, you go, well, I can't play. I'm not a bar chord type of person. I'm an open chord type of person. Okay. Well, let's, let's break that down. You're not a bar chord person because you don't know the steps to do it. Now I've tried a hundred times. I can't do it. Okay, well, let's do this. So what the way I would approach that is I'd say, let's take that, that bar chord, which is six notes, and let's practice the two notes that are on the bottom, that are on the high, that, that are on the, the first two strings. And so we practice that. And they say, well, I want to play a bar chord. And I'm like, 
we're playing a bar chord, but just watch. And then we do the next two strings and then the next two strings. If they have issues with any, with holding any two strings at a time, then we know that that's the area that they need to, to look at. So what people do is they say, well, I don't, I'm not good at bar chords. Okay. Well, there's a specific something about that bar chord. It's probably the same thing that everybody has an issue with, but there's a specific thing about that bar chord. Cause you may be able to play three or four or five notes out of that bar chord, but let's figure out the specific thing that's your Achilles heel the chink mm -hmm. in your armor that's keeping you from completing that bar chord. Because once you can play an F bar chord, I'm going to show you 96 more chords that you can play just because you can physically play that chord. But until you can physically play that chord, these 96 other chords aren't available to you. So like that's the that's the way I've, I've approached bar chords for years with my students is let's not let's not worry about six notes let's worry about two notes and once they get the two notes down we get the three note versions of those chords and then once and don't go on to the four note versions until we get the three note versions down with the goal being I'm going to play this F chord with the bigger goal being if I can play that F chord Eric's going to give me or I'm going to give me 96 new chords that I'm going to be able to play jazz tunes and all sorts of stuff with bar chords. But people, but I mean, that's a lot, right? That's a lot for someone to understand that concept unless, unless we're sitting down and number one, if we have the time to do it and they're asking the right questions and if they believe it and if they apply it, you know, then we see progress. So there's a few, there's a few obstacles there, but at the end of the day, it's always about breaking stuff down. I mean, I'm the same way with piano. If, you know, I, I'm equally, I'd say, frustrated sometimes with piano because, but I, I have the same mindset on, on guitar that I, on piano that I do guitar. And it's like, wait a minute, break it down. So I'm sitting there trying to play Moonlight Sonata and I'm not getting it. And I'm like, let's just focus on that left hand. Let's get those arpeggios mm -hmm. down. Da, 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 da. Okay, now let's do it without looking. Let's just do it on the feel, you know. Okay, great. Now let's work on the melody. Well, what is the melody? Okay, so I'm working out the melody and I'm doing all this stuff together. And then I'll break it down to, okay, well, now I've got both hands. Let's do one measure. Okay, boom, boom. Well, one measure would be easy enough. But, you know, just breaking it down into pieces where there's like, Cookie, 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 reward, 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 um, because that is what keeps us motivated to continue to to do that. You know what I mean? So um, that is the number one thing to me is like my students aren't having fun, which I had plenty of guitar teachers that not only didn't want to be teaching, but I'd come in with questions and stuff and they're like, well, that's easy. It's just an arpeggio over da, 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 da. And, and we weren't learning what it is that they were excited about that week. And you're like, gosh, I'm so glad I had the tenacity to keep going because so many of the students that I had, if I had done that to them, they'd have been out of there. They'd have just said, I'm not cut out for guitar. And I can't tell you how many of those students said, my guitar teacher said I would never play guitar. My last guitar mm. teacher. And I'm like, I'm like, give me that guy's phone number because I'm like, <laughs> I'll kick his ass. <laughs> I don't, I don't understand any teacher telling someone you won't, you won't be able to do this or you'll never it's be lazy. able to like, how it's is that untrue. going to do anything? Yeah. It's untrue and mm -hmm. it's lazy. That means that what that really means. And I've told them this, I said, what that teacher meant is I can't teach you. That's right. That's what he should say. Yeah. Basically you're paying me for a job I can't do. Yeah. Or I don't want to, but it's more like, yeah, I mean, but I don't want to means you can't, I, I can't, you know? Well, cause they're not developing. I mean, being a teacher is a totally different thing than just being able to play. Yes, absolutely. There are plenty of, uh, you know, we were in Nashville, there are plenty of of great session players that I would hang with and what have you. And to try to get them to teach anything or to understand, you know, hey, let's make a course. You could you could do really well at this or whatever. They just don't get the concept, you know. They're just stuck stuck in paradigms. Yep. You know? Yep. Or they try to teach someone and they they just like, well, you just do this. You just do it. Yeah. And they don't know yeah. how to break it down. Yeah, they're skipping like, you know, one to seventeen steps instead of breaking it down slowly, you know. And because it's hard to remember what it was like to be the person that didn't know how to do it, you know. How did I get to here? And that does take some work to go back and, oh yeah, at first I did this and then I did that, you know? Absolutely. And I, I did not add that earlier, but when you asked about what makes my, you know, teaching different, uh, that was, that's one of the things that I've always been able to tap into. I'm like, God, I remember this. And I go back to it and I go, well, now what, do, what did I do? Sometimes I'll take the guitar and I'll flip it over as a lefty and, and I'll go to do stuff. And it's like, I have all the technical knowledge and I'll do it. It just takes longer for me to do it. But I think, well, gosh, that's, that's really difficult. You know, if I try to, to finger pick, it's like, I can do it, but it's slow going. And I know all the techniques and what have you. So 
um, yeah, remembering remembering how we got there is definitively a great thing for a teacher to have. Yeah. Cause it's like riding a bike. Like you can't remember how to not ride a bike. Like yeah. if you get on a bike, you're not going to not balance all of a sudden because you, yes. your, your instincts will kick in and you'll balance. So you don't fall over. Yes. And it's, it's kind of like with voice uh, when you, you haven't figured out how to blend your head voice and your chest voice. And I struggle with this for like six months. I remember going through this and my voice, it just sounded like, like a, like awful, like super breathy and stuff. Cause I didn't know how to blend them. Now I could never go back and make that sound again because I know how to blend them no, and no. I might struggle, you know, and, and, you know, haven't practiced or whatever, but I'll never make that sound I did before when I hadn't learned to blend them to begin with, because you just can't go back. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, it's interesting talking through these things and, and realizing how we got where we are and, and how much it really does take to bring people along from beginner to, you know, to intermediate to advanced. Yeah, I'm constantly telling my students, you know, you have a conscious brain, you have a subconscious brain or unconscious or however you want to look at it. But essentially, your conscious brain can do one thing at a time. Your subconscious can do an infinite amount of things at a time, which is why mm. you can have a, a, you know, a unicyclist juggling on a tightrope and he's doing, you know, all these things at once. Well, he didn't learn that all at once. Not like you said, I'm going to try this. I'm, you know, I'm just going to get up there. No, man, I couldn't, I couldn't do one of those things, but you get one thing down and that's consciously and it goes into your subconscious. Now you can focus on the next thing and it goes into your subconscious. It's like that with anything. It's like that with mixing your, you know, chest and head voice. It's that way with playing bar chords or, or anything that we're good at. And I, I always try to remind people because I know there's listeners out there going, nah, that's, that's not always true. It is 100% always true. And I'll, and I'll, and I'll challenge them to this. There's nothing other than basic bodily functions like crying and sleeping and pooping and what have you that we, that we've done naturally since we were babies. Every other thing, everything from crawling to turning over on our bellies, to walking, to, to driving a car, to, you know, typing, every single thing was learned and every single thing was a challenge in the beginning. It all was. So let's just get used to every new thing. I mean, if I started taking Mandarin today, I would, <laughs> I would, I would suck. And yet there are four-year-olds speaking great Mandarin. Is it because I'm dumb? No, it's because I haven't practiced it. I haven't, I haven't spent enough time marinating in the, the concepts, right? So, and the same thing is true. So that's just something that uh, I'd go toe to toe with anybody and um, and win that one because I just I know that to be true because there's nothing nothing that we don't learn through repetition. Yeah, no, very true, very true. I had it. My child, my first child, she was the type who like if she couldn't do it perfectly the first time, she wasn't going to do it. And I'm like, how are you ever going to learn anything? Yeah. And and this is how she was with piano. And I was like, I cannot teach her. Like the, I will kill her. Like we will kill each that's, other. That's my boy. That's my boy. He does it. He's got perfect pitch and he does other things very quickly. And then he, he sits down and just, eh, you know, plays piano with one finger, two fingers now, you know, but, and how old is, how old is uh, that daughter now? 20, almost 21. Okay. Does she work out of that? I'm interested to know. She did, but she, I, it couldn't be me teaching her. You know, she, we had to find the right teacher for her that could understand her pe perfectionist language. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and she had to grow out of that too. This is when she was four, you know, so yeah. And she and she started to become aware that that she did this and this was a problem and that she was never going to grow until good. she got over that. And, you know, it's not an issue now, but yeah, that's good to know. That's good to know. <laughs> yeah. So I would <laughs> want to ask because we have a lot of, of singers that are watching and listening and and you know, maybe they want to play the guitar so they can write songs or they want to perform. A, a lot of singers that I work with are frustrated that they don't have instrumental skills. And so it really limits them on being able to perform because they don't want to perform with a track and then they have to find a guitarist or whatever and they're not always available. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so I'm assuming there are separate skills or special skills that you learn in order to play and sing at the same time. And is that something that you have to learn? Like you first learn to play the guitar and then you learn to play it and sing because that's how I did with the piano and I struggled with being yeah. able to play and sing, even though I could play great and I could sing great. And is this anything that, that you teach or are there other people that kind of focus on that in the industry? Yeah, no, I, I, I 
I definitively teach that. And, uh, you know, it's kind of going back to what we were talking about there. It's like, so, you know, you sing when you were a little kid. So, so, so many singers, uh, I, I think I'd say even more so with, with females than males, but they're, they were singing at young ages. So it's like, they never, they don't remember a time, not not singing like a bird, right? And you learn some techniques and what have you later on once somebody helps you identify the, the placement, what have you, what's happening with vowels and, and all the rest. But um, then they start playing guitar or piano or something. Now now they're, they're in, unable to do both at the same time. And the reason for that being is that they're having to consciously think so much about that particular thing that they can't think that their subconscious has to has to just bail out too because mm -hmm. if you think about this think about if you were if, if a child was of age where they could talk but they hadn't ridden a bike yet that's my son uh, he can talk, but can't ride, but can't ride a bike yet. So the first time you put them on a bike without the training wheels and you push them, they're not going to be very conversational in that moment. <laughs> they're like literally 110% of their brain is going to be trying to keep them from falling to the ground. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, in that case, just like the juggling unicyclist on a tightrope that I talk about all the time in my lessons, uh, what that person needs to do is not focus on, on singing while they're playing guitar. And they need to just get that as part of their subconscious. And the only way to do that is through repetition. Um, but obviously there's a path that gets them there quicker, just like with voice. You can just sit there and sing all the time and you're going to learn stuff. Um, but there is a path and the path is going to get you there quicker. And so, um, by them learning those essentials and getting those out of the way, like learning the basics of strumming, learning the basics of chord formation. Um, and then what I do is I, in fact, I have a course on this called, uh, singing and playing guitar. Mm. And it's literally addresses that one thing. It's a, it's a, it's a real small course. Um, but Essentially, what I do is I is I I take it from the standpoint that you know both they're 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 trying to do both, but how do we get into that position of 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 singing and playing at the same time? So what I say is just like anything, you strip it down. So if they're singing a song and there's a there's a strum and they're changing chords and what have you, then what I say is let's simplify it. So how can we simplify it? Well, we can take the strum out. You know, we can we're not doing this fancy rhythmic strum. Let's take the strum out for a minute. Because that's probably going to throw you a lot off from 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 the rhythmic structure of your vocal line. And then I say, okay, let's make that vocal line easier too. Let's not, you know, if you're having, if you don't memor have these lyrics memorized, let's take the lyric thing out of it. I mean, each one of these things, you got a melody, you got a lyric, you got the rhythm of the melody, you got the, you know, let's say the melody of the melody, you've got the lyrics, you've got the rhythm of the melody, um, any inflection and everything and all that other stuff. With guitar, you've got the chords, when to change from one chord to what chord, uh, how to set up the fingering, how to strum, uh, my staying in time, and now you've got the conflicting rhythms. So it can seem impossible, but I can say 100% of the time, it's never impossible. It's just difficult. In our brain, will flip sometimes to impossible because it's like th that gets us out of having to do that thing. But if you're obsessed enough, that's not an option, right? So what I'll do is I'll, to, to give you the short of it is what I'll do is I'll say, okay, let's just take, say like the first two lines. And what I want you to do is just strum diamonds. So whole notes, the chords changing. So just strum and sing your line. If, if, if you can't, then something else, you need to take something else away. Maybe take the lyrics away and just hum it. It doesn't have to be full voice, just, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know, and you're just strumming on those, on those downstrokes because the more you can strip away and then you start, and then you start feeling it. And then once you can do that, then you go, okay, well, let's do some quarter notes. So now we're just strumming quarter notes and now maybe we're introducing uh, a lyric, you know, but at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what things you're adding or taking away. What matters is it's doable, it's fun, and you can feel the progress. If it's mm -hmm. not any one of those, then then it means you got to take something away or it's too simple. Like you might just be hitting diamonds and then, you know, we, what we call in Nashville, we'll call diamonds, they're whole notes. So you're hitting whole notes and, and you're just humming the first melody line, no lyrics, and you're just looping it. Like that's a great way to do is just loop it over and over again. But that, right, is it can become boring and this is going to be challenging. So what we want to do is we want to get right in the center of not too easy, 
and not so challenging that we're getting frustrated. So just right on that quan, right on the what I call the edge, um, and just riding that like a wave. And that's how you do it. And, you know, there's no musician. That, that's another thing to know. And it's very helpful is to understand that there is no musician who hasn't struggled with that. And it, you, you look at somebody like Sting. Uh, that guy's a whiz at doing this, right? He's playing all these crazy bass lines. Or, or Paul McCartney, you know, it's like it doesn't, it's almost like a separate person because it is because he's baked both of those things into two separate subconscious people that when they come together, they create what we hear, you know? Yeah. It's a, anybody that plays bass or drums and sings to me, I'm just like, you are an incredible musician. I don't know how you're doing that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But it and all it, became subconscious to them. Yeah, it's all repetition till and, you, and you'll know when it happens because then you'll 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 sing the part while you're playing and you're like, oh, I just did it. And you'll say, well, maybe that was a mistake. And it wasn't a mistake, you know. Now you may not be able to replicate it the second time, but the third or fourth time you will. And then eventually it just becomes more and more and more and more consi consistent. And the more you do it, the more consistent it'll be. That that is one thing that there's no escaping is that repetition that consistency yep and and i've i've definitely talked about this on the podcast before about how i learned how to play and sing at the same time which was a huge struggle for me yeah. um and i've i kind of got an epiphany as you were talking that the way i started really i played with a band um and I, I played keyboard with a band and i felt comfortable doing that and i thought it was because it wasn't all on me and if i had to drop out the song you know it would still go on and I thought that that was why, but I think it's because I didn't have to keep the rhythm of the keyboard while also singing. Like you said, I could play diamonds and yeah. there was a drummer and there was a guitar player and it didn't matter that I did that. But then when I was going solo, because I didn't, I couldn't bring my band with me because they all had day jobs and I had to focus and learn and spend an hour a day being able to do this. That was when I had to add the rhythm back in on the piano. And that was what was hard. And yeah. so, because I think I had had that time in the band where I was playing, Playing, but I wasn't solely in charge of the rhythm that had brought me a little ways closer to being successful. Absolutely. I mean, like taking the process of what you're talking about there and even even putting more of a microscope on it. I can tell you 40 years into playing in bands and everything else now, I when I'm more, you know, and the band that I'm in now, it's, it's called Gabriel the Bull. And our singer, um, he comes up with some really great parts and vocal lines and what have you. And, you know, I'm playing these intricate guitar parts and then he's throwing an intricate vocal line over the top and I've got to learn it. And so what I'll do is I'll find myself going, okay, you know, maybe 75% of it I'll be able to get just right off the cuff. But then there's always those notes or whatever that I'm like, ah, I'm having difficulty with that. And it's good to understand that it's not because we're stupid. It's because there's something about that little structure or that little area that's problematic. So it's like, the beat, maybe the beat is pushing, but you're singing on the beat. There's some syncopation. There's something happening there that you have to unravel. And the only way that you can unravel it is to, you know, if, if it's, we're talking a four measure section, take one measure and now take that one measure and let's talk about one beat at a time. Like where's the, where's the mistake happening? And not only that, you might have to slow it down and go, okay. And I do this all the time. I'm tapping with my foot and I'm going, okay, I'm hitting that down strum on the four, but the vocal line is coming in on the and of four. Ooh, That's yeah. why I'm messing that up. So then what I'll do is I'll do these real exaggerated movements, you know, maybe, maybe, a, you know, for the four, I, I kind of go down with my head mm -hmm. and then for, for the vocal line, I might lean forward to the and or something. I'll always have some sort of visual or some sort of physical thing happening. And then, you notice some of the best musicians, they're, they're just, they're swaying, they're into it because when you do that, you become part of what it is that you're doing, you know, just vibrationally and everything else. And it's so helpful. I was recording tracks this morning and I was not in the groove like I wanted to be. And then I just, I just started, you know, tapping my foot and getting, getting, feeling it and closing my eyes and I got the track that I wanted. But uh, sometimes we can get, you know, that's, we're thinking too much with the conscious part of our brain. It's helpful for things like unraveling or what have you. But then once we have it down, we need to kind of let it go and get, let, let it get into the subconscious. If I'm thinking too much in my conscious brain about anything, but especially guitar, that's, that's when I'll make a mistake, you know?
Yeah, man, all this, this has been so helpful for anybody that plays an instrument um, or is learning to play an instrument, whether it's guitar or not, and learning to play and sing. I love how you've given us an example of how you break things down just in this conversation. And it makes me want to go and, you know, take one of your courses and start playing that guitar again over there. So thank you so much. This has been really, really awesome. Um I'm assuming that the best place for people to find you is on YouTube. Um, yeah, I mean, you can find me there. I'd say, uh, I, honestly, I have so many, you know, free courses and free resources and blogs. And and these aren't just regular blogs. I mean, these are, you know, videos and details and, and a lot of times like PDFs or downloadable things and what have you. So um, and on my website, I've got lots of free courses for folks to get into uh, that will help them with a lot of these things, the strumming, the you know, transitioning chords and, and a lot of those hurts that after teaching, you know, over 10,000 one-on-one lessons, I was like, mm-hmm. okay, these are, these are things that people run into every now and then. Yeah. Oh, that's so great. And you give somebody a small victory and they're, they're ready to go further. And, and that's, what's great about free resources like that. It's like, you get them yeah. over this hump and they're like, okay, I'm all in with you. You help me with this thing. So yeah, what, what is your website where they can find all that? It's your guitar sage your guitar sage um that was just a moniker that i came up with years ago i was ago just curious on. where did you come up why did you come up with that i was literally like oh well i i want to, i'm teaching guitar so and i was like iphones were coming out and all the i and your and this and that so i'm like your guitar sage you're, you know i didn't want to be your guitar teacher right. um spirituality and uh metaphysics and all you know like that, uh, I'm, I'm into all that stuff too. So I was like, wow, that, that's kind of fun there too, you know? So, but yeah, your guitar sage.com. If they just go to the, the, uh, the front page there, they're going to see a lot of, a lot of different paths that they can go for whatever, whatever ails them. Awesome. That is great. Uh, thank you so much. This has been such a fun conversation. I have enjoyed talking about, you know, all the, the intricacies of learning how to master something, which I think has been really interesting and hopefully inspires people that have been listening and watching. If you, if any of these things you've come across and you've gotten stuck, no, like he said, there's no way that you can't get over that if you put in the time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Brie, for having me. I really, really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.